and welcome to the session on common language for e-learning and associated course type codes. You'll notice the subtitle, this is very much a work in progress. And so we welcome you along with our journey at York as we try to figure out uh, modes of delivery and how to communicate them and how to optimize them and how to advantage them. From an outcomes perspective, these aren't outcomes that necessarily you will achieve by the end of the session, but these are also ones that we're working on at the same time. And that's really about envisioning a framework for emerging modes of delivery, considering the implications and challenging challenges of changing the associated course type codes. Things like lecture, blend, remote, whatever your registrarial codes for different modes of delivery are. What are the implications of changing those and creating a, within a framework of emerging modes of delivery in a post-pandemic landscape? And then a bit about how do we actually develop a consultative process for changing current practices and current policies. I have to say, my name is Peter Wolf. as an introduction. I'm a higher education advisor. Um, and one of the initiatives I'm working on very, very pleased to be doing so at York University is with Will Gage, who's the Associate Vice President of Teaching and Learning, and Darren Fernandez, who's the University Registrar. And they've asked me to uh, lead this initiative and also to lead this presentation. Um, and it's a, a project that would be difficult to get to in the current operational era of returning from the pandemic, but it's one that York has recognized as important in terms of moving forward and finding a way to articulate emerging modes of delivery and aligning them with um, course codes used by the registrar, the scheduler, instructors, and students that all have very specific meanings. That's really why we're here. We know that the pandemic has the potential to be transformative in terms of how we offer opportunities for teaching and learning in, in different modes of deliveries. And so what we really wanted to do was use this as a teaching moment, as uh, the Chief Learning and Innovation Officer of the American Council on Education suggests, to think about how we can create a space to capture these emergent modes of delivery but also then to be able to articulate the differences between them and to be able to do so in a way that makes sense administratively, educationally, um, and all the other ways that matter in a university. Uh, and so being able to schedule and communicate different course components of different modes of delivery becomes a challenge when majority of our experience at the undergrad level in many of our universities and certainly at York is the residential in-person LECT lecture. This is really not about responding to the pandemic. This is really about trying to prepare for emergent modes of delivery. We don't know what's going to stick. Is remote going to be here five years from now? What What is high flex? Where does high flex? What's hybrid? Where is hybrid? Where is blended? What's the difference? All of that. Um, but we wanted to create a framework for those emergent modes of delivery to be able to surface. So in order to do that, we had to update York's already existing common language for e-learning document that was created in 2014. And we wanted to then update and align the course type codes that are used to indicate modes of delivery. As I mentioned, lecture, blend, remote, I'm not sure what your institution will have, but certainly everyone will be familiar with those codes. And those are actually pretty important uh, to communicate the type of the pedagogy, whether scheduling is needed, where that scheduling is needed, what kind of experience students can expect, instructors can plan for, and TAs can be embedded within and participate in. And so it's really the blending of those that we are really working on for this experience, for this initiative. Process to date has largely been conceptualizing what a framework might look like. We certainly reviewed the literature. I've been engaged to th see if we can develop a framework, and I'm going to talk about that framework. It's based on locations and timing of learning as variables, and I'll talk about that in just 
uh, a minute. Um, we've talked, obviously, the registrar and the AVP, teaching and learning, vice provost academic, the provost, associate deans, teaching and learning council. This conference is one of the ways we're reaching out to find out what other institutions are doing in this space as well. And then coming out of this, um, we're developing a more formal university-wide collegial process that's yet to be determined. So this is right at the beginning frame, uh, stage where we want to frame this process and, um, and begin to engage our colleagues with it. Where is York right now? What you're looking for, what you're looking at here on the left is the diagram used in 2014 to describe e-learning strategies, face-to-face, -face, classroom aids, computer, laptop instruction, web-enhanced learning, blended learning, and fully online learning. Boy, that feels like a long time ago where these were the most prominent e-learning strategies. A lot of them are still there. They've taken different forms. They've taken different names and other ones have emerged. When we look at the uh, registrarial-based course type codes, again, some of these will be different at your institution. Some may look very familiar, but there's a pretty traditional set of lectures, seminar, online. I don't know if your institution included remote REMT correspondence, if it's paper-based. And that's how we communicate um, delivery modes formally through the institution. So what's changed? Firstly, since the pandemic, and we're not done with it yet, but given even where we are now, we know what's changed is the timing of learning. Students or instructors or guest speakers, class participants can be together live, can be together live in person, together live on Zoom or recorded virtually. Previously, we really only thought about in-person, live. And now there are these variations of timing. Then the other thing that's changed is the location of learning. Suffice it to say, and I don't think I have to uh, talk too much about this, but this is, you could be here, you could be there, you could be everywhere, you could be in multiple places. You could be on campus one day and away the next. Um, you can be around the world. You can be on a field experience. The locations of learning have become more diverse through the pandemic. And so because of the timing of learning and the way that we interact in that timing and the locations of learning have changed so drastically, these are the variables that we decided to look at in articulating modes of delivery. So... This is just an example. I suspect that a lot of these modes and codes will change through the consultation process. So this is very much our starting point. So let's just take some of the more common uh, uh, course codes. For example, lecture. What we've done here, just as an aside, and I don't know whether this will make it through the consultative process, but a lot of people have objected to the term lecture because so much more happens in many of our classes. But lecture does have, the term LECT does have implications from a scheduling standpoint. Um, and so we decided to leverage that and to separate those courses that have a built-in, in-person large class and formal in-person small group learning. So a lot of the intro with labs or, or courses with seminars where there's a lecture component whatever that might mean. Plus there's a separately separate, uh, separately scheduled small group experience. Those require articulation as such. That is different from all the other classes where really there's only one in-person location of learning. And so for the purposes of this exercise and trying to move our nomenclature a bit forward, we're proposing to start to separate lecture into two. One being those that require two classrooms versus those that require one classroom and likely won't be lecturing. It'll be all of the student activities. So in this model you're looking at across the top where it says lecture class, those are commonly both understood currently as lecture. We're considering evolving that definition. And then there's blended, which is some form of in-class live and online not live, asynchronous. So those three 
the main focus of learning, collaborative learning, is the in-person, face-to-face component. And so we can kind of think of those as three versions of ways to get to learn with in-person learning as the primary locale. Then there's one where the online space is the primary locale of learning, and that would be remote, which is synchronous web-based course delivery, and online, which is asynchronous, no contact with the teacher. Those are different in bridging to the registrarial world because those don't need classrooms scheduled. Someone still has to schedule the remote classes, but now they're all online. So it makes sense to articulate those separately from the ones that require classroom scheduling. This seems too technical uh, when you have a moment um, when this is becomes available, this the video becomes available on demand. You might want to just stop and think about what are the differences in location and time across the different modes of delivery and see if this framework works for you. So we've identified the uh, primary location is in person for the first three, then remote and online. There is no in person. The primary location is online. The difference is being synchronous versus asynchronous. And then finally, high flex. Well, we're calling it York high flex synchronous experimentally as a part of a separate pilot, which is the concurrent delivery of in class and online. That is the one where students can choose to attend in-class or can choose to attend web-based and switch as they see fit. That's the definition that work is, uh, York is working with right now at the beginning stages of, of the re-entry from the pandemic. Um, and that one is particularly important to be able to identify because that one requires even specialized classrooms, classrooms that are specially equipped with the ability for synchronous uh, communication through Zoom in, on top of a smart classroom or however your organization has, has uh, organized that. So what we're looking at here is the location and the timing as the differentiators. There's another way to take a look at this. So let me suggest here that on the horizontal axis, we have synchronous versus asynchronous, real-time versus not real-time. Vertically, we have in-person classrooms, not in-person classrooms. And what we can begin to do is map which quadrant or which quadrants particular modes of learning are in. So just a quick, uh, a quick look at this and you can see blended, the third one in, is synchronous in person and asynchronous online. Remote is synchronous online and asynchronous online. Lecture and class are both synchronous in person. And high flex synchronous, the one we're using right now at York, is both or and or synchronous in person or synchronous online. Again, this might be a chart that you might want to just take a look at and think about where would your modes of delivery be mapped onto this chart using time and location of learning as the key variables. That was kind of hard to explain. And the reason is, is that we don't really have a metric by which to articulate what happens when. And there actually does exist a model, but I haven't seen it widely used. And so part of the discussion around developing a framework that fits current and hopefully future modes of delivery is the idea of how do we, how do we count? How do we know where people are putting in their effort? The traditional mode in lecture and in lecture course code is that we count contact time in universities. And typically it's three hours plus lab or whatever, three hours per week. And so we have this Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday split of those contact hours. When you think about some of these modes of delivery, it doesn't fit. For example, online may not have any direct contact between students and, and instructors. It may be all asynchronous. It may not be synchronous and it may not be in person ever. And so using that face-to-face -face contact time becomes irrelevant. 
I had the honor of working at the University of Guelph for much of my career. And there, they had an equivalency that I think might help us explore how to articulate the differences between high flex synchronous and remote and blended and hybrid and lecture and class and all of these modes of delivery um, that we need to be able to articulate separately but are really versions of each other is to consider equivocating, making equivalent, instructor contact time and student expected effort. And student expected effort is the sense of how much in total do we expect students to participate in this course over the semester. Not just the hours spent directly with the instructor, but on assignments, on readings, on group work, all of the activities that contribute to deep learning. So for example, at the University of Guelph, they have articulated that students should note that 10 to 12 hours of academic time and effort per week, including classes, are expected for a 5.0 credit course. This is really important. The way the math has worked, as I understand it, is if a full-time job in a career is 40 to 50 hours a week or so, students divide, taking that 50 hours a week into five courses equals about 10 hours a week per course, per student. This is just an approximate. But this idea that learning isn't just about contact with the instructor, it's about contact with the course. And that can take place in many different ways. And we already have it implicitly in many different ways with homework and assignments and group work and discussions and all the activities that we do or we have students do outside of the face-to-face, in-person, me in front of you time is as important to learning as that face-to-face contact time is. It just looks different in different modes. And so and this model of idea of student effort really comes from this, this distance learning where there is no contact time per se in the traditional mode, and yet there is very serious expectations of student effort. I don't want to suggest that this is the answer to everything, but the idea of recognizing that it's not about instructor contact time with the class, but rather students contact time with the course that will lead to the most deep learning and trying to average that out over eight to 12 hours a week per course is an interesting way to try to frame the idea of timing and locations keeping it in a traditional contact mode framework, it'll be problematic. Because if you've taken a course that's traditionally three contact hours and now you've made it blended and now there's two contact hours, that doesn't mean the students are doing less work. In fact, it means that they're supposed to be doing more work, just not with the instructor in your face. So, as you can see, there's some tensions there. And articulating student, expected student effort as an alternative or as an equivalency to instructor contact time is a conversation that we're going to be engaging in, I suspect. Uh, It's not a given. I think that there's lots of implications. It's certainly one of the tensions. It's helpful, but it creates potentially some expectations and some challenges on its own. So we're going to uh, surface some of those challenges and some of those opportunities during the next process of uh, of consultation. Mostly, it's trying to develop an agreeable framework to articulate and communicate the current and potentially emergent modes of delivery Um, and respecting that they all have their place in different ways and being able to communicate to the schedulers, to the students, and to the instructors where the proportion of activities will take place in terms of the delivery mode will help people to understand the differences between them. That, along with the the developing support that all our teaching centers offer um, and the technology um, units offer as well. One of the big challenges is we're not trying to break the system. We're trying to evolve it. We're trying to respect traditional and widely, widely understood nomenclature while attempting to update the language and to further define them. And that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, 
Some people would rather get rid of LECT as a course code altogether, while others say, ah, it's what we know, and everyone understands what that is. So we'll see how these things play out. One of the other issues is uh, obviously uh, balancing instructor workloads and effort needed for equitable teaching and learning. We've talked about student effort. We also are going to have to talk about instructor effort and workload as a result of this. So the, these are tensions that will be, I suspect, will be playing themselves out in the next um, in the next phase of our consultations. And we're already aware of them and. Um, Looking forward to digging deep. As I mentioned before, the next step is a campus-wide collegial process. What I presented today is in no way beyond a starting point to engage the community. We've created a, a draft document that's now going to go into this collegial process. Hopefully we'll be involved in it as well and be able to influence how that evolves as it works through the university. Thank you for your time and have a nice day.